Welcome back, everybody. Um, hope you enjoyed the music just now. I uh, hope you've got yourself a nice steaming mug of tea or coffee uh, because the weather's foul out there. So don't even think about going out. Stay with the ISM for what is going to be an absolutely brilliant panel session provocatively called Is There a Future for Music Education in England? Um, and some of you may be slightly bristling that we've even put that together as a question, but actually sometimes um, from the confines of the ISM, you do fear for the future of music education and indeed education generally. So this panel is going to be looking firstly at the trends in education. Where are we all going? Are we going anywhere? Um, or are we going round in circles? Um, what is the international perspective? And we have a brilliant uh, former head teacher, Carl Ward, uh, who has worked with the ISM uh, previously and spoke at an all-party parliamentary group, um, incredibly charismatic and is now involved with the Fed. So do check out that uh, uh, link to the Fed. Um, we're also going to be joined with Kevin Rogers, who keeps telling me he shouldn't be here, but I think he absolutely should be here to give his perspective on what should be happening in schools. I know so many teachers uh, refer to you, Kevin, when I, I meet them. So you definitely should be here. Um, and then Janetta is going to be taking into the heart of her school and asking some serious questions. Phil Castang, who everybody will know, I am sure, um, is going to be looking at hubs. Um, I'm not sure how much he can say because the government are quite uh, cagey about whatever is going on on the expert panel. Uh, and we don't want to get him into trouble. Uh, so we have to be a bit careful about that. And then we follow up with Kariatu Kanu uh, Mason. And as she says, that's not her name on the screen. Uh, but none of us are sufficiently technically able in order to get the name right. So and Kariatu, of course, uh, looks after the amazing Kanu Mason family and will be sharing her insights from watching her children go through the state education system. So absolutely brilliant lineup. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, can we start off with Carl? Thanks, Deborah, and thanks for the invite for uh, being able to join this conference today. And uh, good afternoon, colleagues from uh, wherever you are. <clears throat> so my name is Carl Ward, and I'm chair of the Foundation for Education Development, so called the Fed. You can find us online. Um, it's got a, a lot of interest, and it has up over the last two years. We launched two years ago. We're an independent, neutral organisation that believes in only one thing, and that one thing is there should be a long-term vision and plan for education in England, one that goes beyond a five-year political cycle. However, my day job is the chief executive of a multi-academy trust called the City Learning Trust in Stoke-on-Trent, and uh, I've been chief executive of that for eight years previous to that, as Deborah said, a uh, head teacher. Um, so what I'm going to do in the next five minutes is talk to you more broadly about education uh, in England at the moment. And I suppose give a little bit of an international perspective as well. So <clears throat> as probably none of you have, uh, have, 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 have missed at all, there is <clears throat> a new ministerial team, a virtual, completely new ministerial team, <clears throat> except, of course, for universities where that minister remains the same. And one would probably say it's a bit of a sea change. Because Nick Gibb, who's been uh, the Minister for School Standards for 10 years, is no longer the Minister for School Standards. And one might argue that we have already had a 10 year plan driven by Nick Gibb um, across England for education. Um, and, and broadly, you could argue that it was successful in that it implemented great change and it did it pretty much pretty well in terms of the implementation we have a new curriculum and a new way of assessing for example children from that perspective children and young people um, but the changing ministerial team is quite interesting and of course that will now herald as one usually does a rethink on what policy will be driven uh, across the uh, england so <clears throat> nadim zaharway has served as a parliamentary undersecretary before uh, for send and inclusion and I know he's very heavily driven by uh, having an inclusive society. I expect that will tend to come through in his policies. <clears throat> and of course, we have a new school standards minister, Robin Walker, <clears throat> who was PPS to Nikki Morgan when she was Secretary of State for Education. Um, <clears throat> so that, that group of new ministers are looking now at change, no doubt. 
and they will launch a new white paper in the new year, early in the new year, I'm being told. And of course, what the white paper cycle tends to do in education is give education then a focus for what they will want to deliver during the next X number of years. <clears throat> of course, caution should be given to that because an average Secretary of State's tenure is 18 months in post. Um, it's unusual uh, to have uh, any minister in, char in, in place for the amazing amount of time that Nick Gibb was, for example, 10 years. That usually doesn't happen. So what tends to happen is a white paper tends to have emphasis in the first 18 months to two years. And then, of course, a new Secretary of State comes in and wants another white paper. So we'll wait to see what the focus is of, of this team. But if we look back over the, la the last 10 years in education to where we are now, it's probably fair to say that the English education system is an outlier internationally in what it has looked to do. And really, uh, I say that because, uh, and I'm not, uh, I'm not making a, a comment on whether it's been successful or not, just the implementation of it. The reason for that is that we've had this um, skills knowledge debate and knowledge has been very much the focus of your three to 16 journey in education. Skills tends to come after that. That's probably the reason that we've seen a squeeze in arts because the focus has been very much on basic skills from that perspective in the curriculum and a remodel of the curriculum, but not solely. So within that, what we've seen um, um, is, is, is the process of focusing um, that's driven by the PISA League table, that international league table that ranks countries. And of course, that ranking of countries has seen over that period of time a great success for the English education system. If you design, if you, if you consider the great success to be rising up the league tables, because we are now equal to a much vaunted Finland education system um, that um, is now <clears throat> um, England now competes against according to the PISA League table. I'm sure that'll be a topic of conversation uh, and discussion as we go through uh, the, the, the next hour or so. So um, we have seen from the previous Secretary of State, Gavin Willoughby, sort of focus on uh, a big focus. And in fact, as Michael Barber was only saying earlier in the week, he's one of the only Secretaries of State in education for the last 10 years that's actually focused on the skills post-16 sector. There's been a real focus on that FE sector. That's unusual from Secretary of State for Education, and that's still flowing through now. And I suspect that will still get the support from the new Secretary of State and the new ministerial team. So that will continue. The interesting debate will be to see how there is a flow back down the system of skills into pre-16 and whether that becomes something that's, go that's going to be a focus of um, the new ministerial team in the back backdrop, I think, quite generally, of COVID and the hit that COVID has had on the education system. Probably the change in the way people think, and we've seen that hugely in the work of Fed in the last two years, and whether or not there is a feeling that our education system, to what extent, I suppose, is able to support um, the need of business moving forward in our economy. And I know that, you know, that, that Deborah, we talked before about the significant amount of, of musicality in the economy that is successful for, for business uh, and the concern that, that, that a shrinking of the music curriculum will lead to a shrinking of the business end of that in the economy over time. So we we'll wait to see really whether or not in the white paper we're going to see over the coming years that shift. And I know the business community have heavily lobbied government um, in the past couple of years to look to see um, that, that there should be that flow back down with skills. And for my part, I think knowledge and skills aren't a debate. I've, ne I've, I've always been a teacher that believes in knowledge education. When I was a teacher in the classroom, that's the basis of everything a child knew. But you can't do that without applying that knowledge into skills. So for me, it's never really been a debate. But for some, it's been quite a heavy debate from that point of view. So, Deborah, I know that's coming up to the end of my five minutes now. I, I, I think really I've, I've tried to give a pricey of where I see we are um, politically and policy wise in terms of our education system and where we might be going in the future. Thanks for listening, everyone. You're on mute, Deb. 
just going to ask you one question, Carl, before we go on to Kevin. And that is um, business has been also saying um, that the young people who are coming through into their businesses often do not have the creativity or problem solving skills that they need. Is that something that has been resonating across with you? Um, I, I think that really focused schools do the creativity anyway and focus teachers and I see a lot of them get the, the fact that you know you need to combine knowledge skills and creativity together to get children to learn I suppose where it comes down to it where schools are under great pressure especially um and and that's not happened in the last two years necessarily because the pressure's been different hasn't it the pressure's been feeding kids mm -hmm. train, transferring digital curriculums to teach children at home isolation all that sort of thing but the pressure pre that and we're coming back into that of course was league tables and Ofsted and mm -hmm. where schools are under pressure under league tables and Ofsted their head teachers will drive their staff to focus on the core things they are measured against yeah and they are mm -hmm. not measured against creativity then that's a misnomer because to do really well in courses, whatever the courses are, children need to have creativity to understand what they're doing and ramp that up. So, so but, but it can easily happen when you are focused on the league tables and you are focused on an Ofsted because you think your job might be in trouble. Absolutely. Really interesting to hear that analysis. Slightly different from what Mark Phillips was saying in the keynote. So on to you, Kevin. Thank you, Deborah. And I think the most obvious response to the question for this session is there must be a future for music education. <laughs> I think the hard of it is how we make that happen. And for what it's worth, I'd like to suggest three key principles about how we define music education to inform teaching, the impact of government policies on schools and the importance of training and research for teachers. So I think the first point is that we must all agree what a full and effective music education is. Is it opportunities to participate in music making, bands, choirs, workshops, concerts? Is it studying an instrument for a sustained period, you know, learn the clarinet? Is it musical learning through curriculum provision, classroom music for all? Uh, of course, I'd argue that each of these aspects should be integral parts of music education for all students. But I'd also say that I think we need to be much clearer with policymakers and leaders about just what each of those areas is trying to achieve and how they relate to each other. Because I think there is some confusion. Um, the ISM's document, A Broad and Balanced Music Education, offers a simple framework for this and tries to clarify the implications for both teaching and learning in all of those areas. To give a simple example of why this is so important, um, and it partly chimes with what um, Mark Phillips was saying earlier this morning, an ISM survey in 2018 found that more primary schools were offering instrumental lessons, which are of course not statutory, than were delivering national new curriculum music in the classroom. What's more, 20% of those who were teaching the national curriculum said their plans didn't articulate the progression in learning expected for music. So was that teaching just offering musical activities in the classroom or was it offering genuine musical learning? And I think that leads to the obvious comment that effective learning in music and the teaching that leads to it has been consistently articulated in the past. So that, while there's never been a, a kind of golden age for music education that we somehow need to rediscover, previous initiatives have given us a coherent view, especially about effective music teaching in the classroom. And this debate isn't new. So the ISM's resources on musical understanding provide access to many of those relevant documents from the past. And I think they do offer us effective solutions to many of the questions we are facing now. So the second thing I wanted to say was about the fact we must ensure that government accepts recent policies have almost destroyed music education in many schools, even when those policies are often not explicitly about or for music. That's what Carl was just saying, many are to do with accountability. We're all aware about the impact of SATs in primary schools, especially in year six, and of EBAC and Progress 8 in secondary schools. But the problems are wider than this. The policy, for instance, of greater subject content in the national curriculum and GCSE exams, again, that Carl just mentioned, they've created real pressure on timetabling and music has suffered as a result. Adding to that, you could argue inconsistent COVID guidance has only made matters worse. And the recent ISM document, The Heart of the School, is missing. 
um, found that in primary schools alone during the pandemic, there was a two thirds reduction in classroom music, that in a third of primary schools, there was no face to face instrumental learning, and that in three quarters of primaries, there was no extracurricular music at all. So I think we must continue the campaigns to remove the policies which have created negative impacts. But we also need new positive policies introduced. So let's see what the new team does at the DfE. Uh, so in a typical secondary school, music currently contributes just 1% of the school's Progress 8 measures. What positive incentives could now be provided for a head teacher to improve music education beyond altruism? Um, and finally, we must ensure there is a well-trained workforce. That means proper engagement with music in teacher training and long-term subject-specific CPD. As the ISM State of the Nation report recommended in 2019, the government must ensure that primary teachers have access to high quality, subject-specific learning, subject learning opportunities relating to music through their training, NQT period and beyond. Now clearly that applies to all phases. And to give some idea of what it might mean, I can offer this personal example. After six or seven years of secondary teaching, I was offered the chance to join a two year course of music specific CPD involving three blocks of four day residential courses each year. Yes, 24 days over two years. Now I'm not saying we should go back and copy that model, but it gives a sense of the scope and intensity of what is needed. And a critical part of that CPD was our own classroom based research. So I'd make a final related plea. Whatever new ideas emerge, they must be row tested in schools from a wide range of different contexts for at least a year before they are launched. Thank you. Kevin, that was so, so rich. Um, I, I hope you've written that speech down somewhere so we can put it up on the <laughs> iListening website. I might have done. <laughs> <laughs> because it was just so, so good and really densely packed with uh, thoughts and recommendations. Um, so I'd like to uh, go now to Janetta Hurst, who is, well, you're no longer at the chalk face, are you? I'm not sure what they call it now, but oh, oh it is the chalk face. Okay. <laughs> so over to you and what is happening within your school, your experience, and do take in the pandemic, etc. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, just briefly, I'm Janetta Hurst. I'm the head of music at Joe Richardson Community School in East London. And I've led secondary music for 16 years um, in a range of schools. I sit on the strategic board of Lambeth Sounds Music Education Hub. And I also work freelance supporting a number of music and arts organisations. And I'm a flautist in my training and currently developing my bass playing because I have to keep playing um, to inspire my students. So um, to jump into what's happening in schools, I would say at the moment, the most pertinent consideration for schools is certainly recovering from the, the last 18 months with the pandemic and continuing to ensure we have effective music provision in the heart of a pandemic. So things have really changed. Um, we've always considered the well-being of our students. However, I would say any great head teacher at the moment should certainly be considering the well-being of staff. Um, but that sits against a backdrop of challenges, including probably uh, the most difficult one, stretch budgets, cover implications, um, staffing, pupil attendance, which has taken an absolute battering um, and continues to be a huge problem for us. Um, cleaning costs, all of these things. So we, in amidst all of that, have to continue to ensure that music is being made safely for our young people. So the things that teachers here will be thinking about is um, sufficient ventilation, cleaning equipment, which we've never had to do before. We have to clean equipment between lessons, we have to clean equipment um, and ensure that students feel comfortable and confident to be using that. Um, that's got a time implication. So, um, you know, we have to really think about how we're using our time and be creative and do things differently. In my personal experience, I would say that the young people want to play music. They are really glad 
that they are back in their classroom, they're out of bubbles and they're able to practically make music again. Um, they've come back to school since March, very appreciative of the opportunity to be in school with their peers and to be with their class teachers face to face as opposed to over a screen. Um, I suppose there were some benefits if I should look for the positives of the last 18 months and certainly the lockdowns that we had and home learning. I think that children's ability to listen and analyse on a deeper level has significantly increased um, and I'm really pleased about that because that supports us with what we're trying to achieve at Key Stage 4. However, I would certainly say that in amidst um, the knowledge rich curriculum, certainly in our school, we're fully supported by our SLT to continue making music a practical experience and we're going to continue to push that. Um, one of the other challenges I would say is that Understandably, I mean, a lot of children would have been at home with multiple siblings with nowhere to practice during the pandemic. So we're, we're seeing a drip into students understanding they need to practice their instruments again. It's not quite the same as it was, but we're, we're getting back to where we'd like to be. In terms of the place of music, I've always chosen and, and schools have chosen me to be in places where music is valued. Um, so it's it's of huge importance in my current school and always has been for me. Um, I was sharing with the panel earlier that I've had to reinvent myself many, many of times in any school setting that I've been in. So making sure that the needs of the young people are at the heart of what I'm providing and I'll continue to do this wherever I go. I think that uh, the main challenge is the, as I've mentioned really, the provision of a high quality music education against the challenge of resources. And I think that our responsibility is to continue to encourage live performance, opportunities to make music in ensembles, which is coming back. Children are feeling more confident now to attend ensembles and clubs, extracurricular, co-curricular. Um, and also schools really must engage with their music education hubs. So that is absolutely key to ensure that we are providing the best possible opportunity. Um, we've heard a lot about accountability measures so far this morning this afternoon, sorry, I would say that the EBAC has clearly had a detrimental effect um, on numbers of students studying music at Key Stage 4 and that then has, as we know, a direct impact into Key Stage 5. Um, in the schools that I've been in, I have to say I've had a tremendous amount of support to ensure, and in my current school, we, we are student focused. We, we have a pathway system that allows students to study the subjects that they love um, that then has a knock-on effect for everything else they're doing in the curriculum if they've got a reason to come into school something to look forward to multiple times in the week they're going to perform better elsewhere um, and, and that's at the heart of what we're doing um, i would just finally say due to time that two things actually um it would be remiss of me to mention that um you know the the key stage four curriculum is something that needs to be looked at. I'm really keen to see the outcome of these um, reviews that are going on because there are a huge number of young people that are missing out. They are almost, they, they may not be excluded, but they may feel excluded from studying music at key stage four because of the knowledge which emphasis Obviously, that's key stage three where we have to do that work to prepare our young people, but that work needs to be done to continue to allow music to be open to everyone past the age of 14. And finally, I think through the pandemic, teachers really warmed up to this idea of networks. Um, there are several networks that I won't even know about, some that I know about have been Listen, Imagine, Compose with Sound and Music, Birmingham City University, BCMG, that's been going for years. I was one of the teachers that was a part of that when in its first inception. That still continues to do great work. Um, we're about, we have launched the Every Copy Counts campaign for PMLL. In that program, teachers will have an opportunity to network regularly. And I think music education hubs can also play a key role in ensuring that there are CPD opportunities and opportunities for teachers to get together and talk and share experiences going forwards. Absolutely brilliant, uh, Janetta. I want to be a student in your school studying music. It just sounds fantastic. Thank but you. interesting what you're talking uh, there about exclusion, et cetera. Um, and knowledge rich curriculum, key stage four, key stage three, that whole bundle of stuff 
which may not actually be doing our youngsters justice at the moment. Um, so you mentioned hubs. So we're now going to hand over to Phil, who is a leader of a hub and a leader of a venue as well. Um, and Phil is a man of many parts. So over to you, Phil. Hello, uh, thank you for having me this morning. Um, so I'm Phil Castang, Director of Creative Learning and Engagement at Bristol Beacon. So uh, as Deborah mentioned, I'm responsible for uh, running um, the largest concert venue in the Southwest, currently undergoing a hundred million pound redevelopment. Um, and as part of that, I'm responsible for the Music Education Hub and a community engagement program. Um, and I'm also chair of the Music Education Council. And um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what I think should be in the national plan. Um, and so uh, when I was invited to be on the expert panel, I had five minutes thinking, great, you're on the expert panel, you're in the room and you always wanted to rewrite the national plan for music education, go Phil. And then I've had three months of sleepless nights worrying about it. Um, it it's a hugely um, stressful. Um, it's very pleasurable. Um, everybody's very nice, but it's a huge worry to get this as right as possible, obviously. Um, the challenges are many um, and uh, there are so many competing forces. If you gave me the keys to the treasury, I know what I would do, but um, the reality is uh, quite different. So I'm going to start with, in terms of workforce, very obvious, and it's been mentioned several times, it's mentioned all the time, we need a well-trained, valued, financially valued, representative workforce to del deliver all the points I'm about to mention. Um, and in my view, there should be a completely separate plan for creating a supportive, rewarding career for self-employed and employed instrumental singing music teachers uh, uh, training and workforce representation is a big issue everywhere. It's a huge issue for us. We have 400 children on a waiting list for a music lesson right now. That's 400, uh, which is incredible. And I'm sure that's echoed across the country. Really, the in my view, the plan should really clearly set out everyone's role within uh, the music education ecosystem that's hubs and schools and teachers and national uh, youth music organizations um i think it, it the previous plan felt like a sort of technical document for music education hubs with some additions inclusion should be front and center and not an additional kind of paragraph with children in most need receiving the necessary support that they need uh, through perhaps through remissions so that every child that wants to play or sing or compose can. Every music education hub should have a trained SEND lead and every child attending a special school should have access to the same or comparable opportunities as every other child. Every school should have a fantastic music lead uh, a coordinator or subject head and a budget for music. Schools should have timetabled music and music uh, enrichment or extracurricular music absolutely as at the heart. Early years is a critical developmental phase and music should really feature there too, in my view. Um, Singing should run as a golden thread throughout all musical activity with high quality singing experiences really starting uh, in upper key stage one. We need a comprehensive out of school program of localized music centers for ensembles, bands, choirs, music production, etc. Um, and there are many good examples all around the country but with some fantastic music centers that hubs lead. Um, music education hubs need to be relevant to all schools, including schools that have a great music department already and can't really see what the local music hub can offer. And I feel that this is a this has been a problem. Um, if schools can do everything really well, and then hubs need to to provide to wrap around that and be really supportive. We need um, music education hub to be properly accountable and held to account. So it's one thing making it accountable 
but then you actually have to hold it to account if something's going wrong. Um, we need policy changes to reverse the decline in GCSE and A-level music. That's everybody knows that. Um, we need uh, uh, music education hubs to organize partnerships effectively on the basis of collective impact, really strong partnerships, very deep and sustainable. We need to set out how we're going to support progression through pathways and into the pipeline of a career, including into industry opportunities or into further education and higher education. We need to set out the role of um, national youth music organizations and grassroots youth music organizations more clearly in relation to music education hubs. And I would include MPOs, national portfolio organizations in that as well. There's significant money going into music education and it is quite scattered and that increases the problem. Investment in instruments. I think we, we spent around 80,000 last year on instruments, which is a lot for a music education hub. Um, and um, my feeling is we're getting to a point at which hubs are running out of instruments um, that are working. Um, and we need to replenish the stock on a national basis. Access to inspirational experiences and mass participatory events are just critical and uh, I feel that children in rural are areas are missing out on those experiences. We need to do more in rural areas. A much better whole class ensemble tuition experience is needed with agreed outcomes. So there is something to kind of benchmark a uh, whole class with. It's just the experience is so uh, uh, variable around the country. An impact assessment framework that evidences the outcomes of music education hubs annually. And we need to allow music education hubs to develop specialisms and to innovate. Um, and, and that's something that we've been very keen to do ourselves and we, we, we welcome it wherever it happens around the country. And I would like to make a final point um, uh, at, at, that, you know, hopefully we'll have um, a fantastic refreshed national plan for music education. Um, but um, my feeling is that we we need to be uh, together in raising up the standards and doing more, um, regardless of what happens with government, regardless of what happens with the national plan. Um, we are free to work together and create a better music education environment. Um, and I always saw the, the National Plan for Music Education as the very minimum that we should be doing, not as the totality or the maximum, but very much as a starting point. And so, you know, honestly, we've never really done the National Plan. We've done the National Plan Plus. Um, and I think we, we must see whatever, whatever we end up with in those terms. Um, so that's it. I hope I've included everything probably haven't thank you you're muted deborah sorry fantastic contributions from everybody this morning and i do think everybody should just go into a room and write the national plan because we've got we have got the expertise amongst us you know add mark phillips in and of course the early years panel and, and you're done, fixed, end of. So, um, and we'd probably do it without uh, having to get people to sign NDAs. Um, so just a thought, just a thought. So on to uh, Kariatu, who um, is looking at this from very uh, many different perspectives. Obviously she's got this extraordinary family who uh, perform internationally. But how did they get there through the state school system? Would they still be able to do that, does she think? And if she was uh, the uh, if she was the Minister for State for Schools, what would she do? So over to you, Kadiatu. OK, so I've just been introduced, really. I'm Kadiatu Kane Mason, the mother of the Kane Masons. I, my experience in education is in higher education. So I was a university lecturer in English, not in music. Um, so I come at this issue as a parent and as someone for whom music education has always been vital. 
When I think about this issue, I have three points of reference in mind. One is my own school days and experience of music education at a state comprehensive in South Wales. This is in the 1980s. The second is my older five children, five of seven, and their progress through a state comprehensive in Nottingham. And the third is my youngest two. There are three years between the fifth and the sixth child and their rather different experiences at the same state school, which is now a state academy school in a multi-academy trust. So I'd like to talk to Carl about that as well. <laughs> <laughs> Has not been a positive experience. As a child, I would have loved to have studied music further. I played the piano to grade seven, nearly grade eight, um, didn't do the exam, but I lacked the in-depth teaching and any introduction to wider repertoire beyond the grade exams. I longed to play the violin, but the primary school didn't have one, so I had to play the clarinet instead. So it was not a golden age, but I had free one-to-one -one clarinet lessons with a specialist clarinet teacher in school every week. From primary through to secondary, I was in the school band, the large school orchestra, school choir, I was involved in playing for all the school musicals and I had mandatory music lessons as part of the curriculum where we studied notation, we studied classical music. This was in a poor working class area dominated by the Tanwern Steelworks and in what was deemed as a very rough comprehensive school that had recently been the local secondary modern. So this is not a posh school. Um, music education was deemed a necessary and central part of the curriculum and the creative and performing arts were an unquestioned part of everyone's school life. It was the same or actually far more developed with extra initiatives and funding for my husband Stuart because of course he was in London um, where I was in rural um, steelworking Wales. But Stuart as a child, under the jurisdiction of the Inner London Education Authority, he had um, free, very specialist cello and piano lessons. And there was, of course, a county orchestra, everything. So this was the late 70s to the early and mid 1980s. Roll on to 2001, when my eldest was five years old. By then, we were in the state school system in Nottingham. And as parents who were brought up with free music education, we were looking for the same for our children. Now, with seven children, there was no way we were going into the private school system, even though we didn't, although we didn't believe in it, but we wouldn't have been able to do anyway. Um, by now, you had to look for the right school with the head teacher who valued music and wanted it to be available for all. We searched and we found the primary school. It wasn't difficult, very close to us, central in the city and very diverse. The secondary school, a state city comprehensive, we again sought out. Not every head teacher cared about music and it was becoming evident that schools could choose to sideline the subject. What made the school stand out was its sense of order, community, mutual respect, academic and sporting achievement and excellence in music. It was designated then a performing arts school and was rated outstanding by Ofsted. It was in a very deprived area, um, very diverse intake. The children were able to go into school, play music in a context where it was expected and encouraged and thrive. And that's how they were able to become musicians. Then in 2016, there was the multi-academy takeover. The head teacher was removed, a hostile business head put in their place, a swathe of music teachers sacked, the cello teacher pointedly removed, and many teachers of all subjects sympathetic to music and the performing arts resigned because that's how the school worked. The whole teacher ethos was to be involved in music. So teachers of all subjects were part of the choir, um, were part of the orchestra and encouraged music. So what happened was in the space of one year, 70 teachers left. Ofsted rated the school down to good 
because music was no longer central and the atmosphere in the school became more aggressive among the children and the sense of well-being, nurturing and possibility started to diminish. So what happened over those years from the 1980s to recently is the acceptance and expectation that music is for everyone. Um, and then it became a matter of school choice and then there was the rapid removal of choice. I see the issue as a matter of funding priorities, of course, but also of ideology. The government has been very deliberately whittling away at, the mu at music to both dumb it down and to make it less academic and less central and then to brand it as unnecessary. And I think there's definitely been a progression there. Two things need to happen, in my view, um, and not just within music education. If we don't reinstate our social respect and understanding for creative intelligence across all subjects, the ability to think, analyse, express and communicate, the majority of our children will not have access to music. We all know why that matters. I know I'm preaching to the converted, but there is a policy direction that calls for challenge and it's being dressed up as pure financial constraint. So to summarise, I would isolate four points. The first is the culture fear. The idea that classical music and advanced instrument learning should only be for certain groups of privileged children that offering excellence in music is somehow insensitive to black and working class children for whom the music is not within their culture. The second is music has to be centrally mandated, part of the national curriculum and not a head teacher choice, which means of course it needs to be a core subject and properly supported and maybe this whole idea of course subjects needs to be looked at more carefully. The third point is the relationship between professional musicians and schools should be enhanced. Music teachers, including instrumental teachers, need to be given the chance to teach music effectively. Scrap whole class instrument teaching. In my view, it does not work. It's a nonsense and it ticks a box while achieving nothing. Now, the fourth point is my children navigated the system, firstly, by having parents who were offered music education themselves as children, understood its value and learned not to accept exclusion. Secondly, by having schools that offered and welcomed music as part of their whole school culture. And thirdly, by having parents who were prepared to undergo a huge amount of financial sacrifice to pay for private music lessons and I think that last point needs to be made unnecessary. Okay, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> you done it again. You should definitely be Secretary of State for Education uh, because you've just got it all sorted. So much in that speech again. Um, and I don't quite know where to start because it is so rich. I just want to pick up on the, the stuff around the multi-academy trust point, um, because obviously Cole runs one of these things. Are they necessarily bad? Um, now, at the ISM, we hear stories of chains of trusts deciding to get rid of music teachers. That is quite common. We also hear um, them reducing the terms and conditions for music teachers and downgrading music generally. Now, is there something internal within a trust chain that does this or is or what is going on? Is that a question for me, Deb, I think, isn't it? Yeah. There's, there's nothing internal, no. What it comes down to, like any business, like any school, if you were to, you know, sort of sort of take it away from the groups to a single, uh, when there's a change of leadership, um, sometimes there's a change of emphasis for whatever reason. Um, so, you know, you, you, you probably know that, um, that um, um, my trust attempted to open... Uh, with the Halle Orchestra, a specialist music school as a free school a few years back, um, which got rejected by the DfE. 
uh, and we didn't continue to move that forward um, because we didn't think there was much point, to be honest with you. Although we still work very closely with the Halle and, um, and uh, you know, we're, we're, we are um, we're, we're hopeful of, of, of uh, other announcements in due course, so to speak, over the next couple of months. So it depends, really, doesn't it? I think what it comes down to is, uh, and I think I've been articulated across all our speakers, is that um, education is so much about people. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, 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 uh, last Sunday night I watched an audience with Adele, and a t and probably a lot of people watching today might have, and uh, on ITV, and um, you know, the, the the teacher that came on stage and Adele crumbled into tears because I prank, prank, frankly probably do the same, but she said to the teacher, "Oh, oh, that, that was possible because of you," and that teacher spent just one year in Adele's life not their entirety of you know a secondary school or a primary school doing that what it comes down to I think ultimately is people and if you if you you know so so there's nothing in a mat uh, no structures no systems um that um will dictate anything um in fact you make the mat what you want it to be and it comes down to the vision of the CEO and the uh, the executive team which includes the head teachers around it but sometimes, sometimes mats have to go in uh, and pick up a school that may not seem like it's in difficulty from the front. And I, I'm, I don't know if that was the example given, but from the back, the engine room, yeah, it's in massive difficulty and it was just waiting to go over a cliff. Yeah. And, 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 and you have to make decisions sometimes based on that. Um, I, I wouldn't necessarily make the decisions that I see other colleagues make, but that's the individuality of it, I think, really, to be honest with you. And, that, and, 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 and you know, it's like any organisation you run, it comes down to the person who's leading it, their vision and, and aspiration and commitment to whatever, you know, they, they think is right for their communities. Right, OK. I and mean, I think it's a tricky area, this, because I know all academy chains are different, but sometimes they do seem to veer off into... <coughs> Uh, unfortunate directions. Um, Phil, we've got a question for you, and I'm afraid a lot of these questions are very, very challenging. Um, so uh, you'll have to put your plated armor on, okay? So, um, and there are a lot of very challenging questions for you, Phil. I'm just trying to work out where we start. Um, firstly, okay, the workforce. So everyone's been talking about the importance of the workforce, and I think we all agree with that, but, but within the music sector, an awful lot of the teachers, Perry's, etc., are on hourly paid zero hour contracts. So, um, and in particular within the hubs uh, themselves. So how, how can you actually achieve all of your ambitions when the workforce isn't necessarily being valued or looked after that well? Yeah, well, I think it goes back to um, uh, the the coalition uh, government in 2011 and the, the bringing in of music education hubs replacing music services and essentially a trashing of the profession. Um, and this, this happened everywhere, that you had experienced um, instrumental music teachers and singing teachers who were essentially made redundant within six months of music education hubs coming on stream. Hubs had to do that to survive because they had something like a third to a half of their funding cut. And to survive in a really short space of time, many of them just had to go through and cull the workforce. And in doing so, it was not rep ever replaced with any kind of system or anything that was remotely fair. It was just go off and be, be a freelance teacher. I remember sitting down with um, teachers to explain to them how to do well, We're losing you a bit there, Phil. Um, I think we're losing you a bit. Um, I'm going to go across to Kevin. Not um, no. it, oh, I think we're, I'm going to go across to Kevin, okay. So there, it kind of links on to that. There is an issue around the workforce. Mm. And, you know, the changes have made it much more difficult, I think, in terms of professional development, career development, etc. Mm. All those structures that were there say 10, 15 years ago, have gone. 
Um, one of the questions here is there is a highly skilled VMT workforce. Could this be better utilized and integrated? Hmm. Short answer, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, the complicated question, as always, is is how. Um, I mean, as, as Phil's just been explaining, you know, that so many of that workforce that used to be part of a, I suppose in, in the, the old days, a music service that was part of a local authority that had a local authority music advisor with local authority schools, though it didn't always happen, you know, like Carl was saying, the structures don't always determine success. It's the people leading those structures that matter but it meant that there was a, a system in place that everybody could talk to each other and work together. Once everything has become fragmented, it's finding mechanisms to enable the people to get back together and work again. Um, the question then is, how are they utilised as well? Um, I think I would be wary about suggesting necessarily that, the and I don't think this is probably behind the question, but instrumental teachers in the classroom um, mm. And I, th I think that's maybe a different question, but as part of that culture that Kadiata was talking about, about music in the school, and that's why I was talking about those three different areas that need to integrate. You, yes, you've got the curriculum work. Yes, you have the instrumental learning and you have all the events, residencies, workshops, trips, all that stuff. The, the, the instru visiting instrumental teachers can often be the, the weft and the warp that bind all those things together. And I think that's maybe how that they can most effectively be utilised, even though obviously there will be specific occasions when they can be brought into the classroom as well. Mm. You know, music teachers, I'm sure Janetta will say this, you know, I, I love to hear about your bass playing, Janetta. Um, music teachers can't necessarily teach everything. Music is so diverse um, mm. in terms of the, the styles of the instruments. So if you if you accept that and you say, well, who can I bring in who can do that? You know, that's where it comes from. So um, over to you, Janetta, if you could pick up Kevin's point there on VMTs. And then I'd like you to go on to another question, um, which is during the pandemic, there's been plenty of music making outside of schools. So children have been making their own music. That's what my question says. Um, so how are you, if you are, continuing those musical practices that may have developed outside of school uh, during the pandemic. So the first one picking up Kevin's point and then moving on to outside musicking. Well, um, I once was a, a VMT myself. So I, I used to be a woodwind teacher for Birmingham Music Service, um, pre-secondary school teaching. And so for me, one of the keys of success in my department has been employing a combination of uh, private instruments teachers and those provided by music services or music hubs and having apps an absolute commitment to having the best people that I can find in my school um, and in my department and so um, you know uh, having a combination as you said Kevin of sometimes people popping in keeping that conversation going they're absolutely vital so um, visiting music teachers are absolutely top of my list of importance in the, the department in terms of the music making that was going on outside of schools i think the thing is it varied for so many different children so a lot of the music technology offers that you know certainly in our school we had to have a really creative approach to uh, the online learning because most children didn't have an individual device when there were four children in the house or in the flat there isn't an individual device to use so we had to be really creative about that. A lot of um, stuff was done around uh, soundscaping and graphic scores and creating music with your environment, whatever you have, and fantastic for the children that could go and jump onto a, a session with Kinetica Blocko online. Amazing, that was fantastic. But for the children that couldn't do that um, and, and bring everyone back together, it has been, to succinctly answer the question, it has been a reworking. So we have had to create a curriculum to provide during lockdowns and home learning. And then now we are in the situation where we've recreated another curriculum to, um, to account for almost, I don't want to say a missed year of learning, but for our year eights, so they've missed a year of year seven practical music making effectively. So we've rewritten a new curriculum and then we now need to also rewrite the curriculum again for the year after. So there's an, an enormous amount of work 
being done and to be done but it's um talking to the children about what they've done and starting with them and building upon that is how I'd answer that question right okay um over to you Kaliatu just thinking about your own experience as a parent um and uh, the learning that your children have gone gone through how much is that being actually coming through the school and how much is it something that has come extracurricular or you've had to pay for it or whatever what's the balance like now I think that it's all of those things I think if we just paid for it and they went off to private lessons and they went into a school that had no music they wouldn't have carried on it, I mean it wasn't it, what it was and still is I mean a, an amazing school and um, what it did do was if every child that came into the school as soon as they were in year seven they had to learn an instrument it was violin it was recorder um, they were encouraged to learn um, to, to go into all the there were several bands and orchestras and the whole ethos of the school was around music and it meant that the children I mean the boys were in the football team but they could also walk into school with their violins and cellos and be supported and celebrated there was a huge boys choir that went from year seven until sixth form and was was huge and there was no there was no stigma about belonging to that and I think to have that in a city-state comprehensive school is extraordinary and I really do think that they would not have carried on if they'd went to a different school. A lot of the people I know um, have to homeschool their children um, because they cannot go into a state school and learn music to that extent. So um, I do worry about my younger two. My younger two, of course, are in a different situation. They've got five elder siblings who are all professional musicians. That's fine. They, they will be fine. But so many of their friends are not fine. And coming back after the pandemic, my youngest one is now in year eight. She was starved of music in school for the whole of year seven, obviously, for obvious reasons. And now there is no orchestra so they've put together a band but the only other child um my daughter my my 16 year old plays violin the 12 year old plays cello there's one other cellist who because of the pandemic has not picked up the cello for two years the cello teacher is now gone um and she's asking um mariatu what's the name of this string um, so it's, it's really difficult and it's so difficult for those children. So many have just fallen by the wayside and that's the tragedy. Oh God, that, that all sounds so depressing. Um, there's a lot that we could go on for another half hour, but unfortunately we've only got another three minutes. I'm going to ask two quick questions. Um, the first one goes to Carl, the second one goes to Phil. The first one is, Carl, is it true that assessment of creative skills in the PISA uh, league tables just does not, we do not take part in that particular assessment. You know, I think it is. Um, having said that, we should also be aware that PISA is changing the way it does things moving forward. Right. Yeah. Uh, so that's probably good because they recognise that in the world of AI and human flourishing, yeah, there's going to be a need to assess countries differently. So it's what's this space. Right. OK, something we need to pick up on. And lots of questions on the national plan um so and i know you may not be able to say much phil but two questions why is the national plan being written behind closed doors and is there going to be the opportunity for consultation with the workforce um yeah i can't answer why it's being done behind closed doors i'm not sure that's exactly how i would describe it and um, there's fantastic uh, people around the table with great experience i think the the government and i'm not here to defend anybody would say that they did quite a lot of consultation we can all argue about the quality of that consultation and the value of it um, but they would argue i'm sure if they were here that they had done consultation um, and I believe that there will be other opportunities for people to input from schools. So teachers will be involved. Um, and I, so I think there are um, there is a, a, a process, an ongoing process that will include other people that aren't around that table. Um, but I can't really tell you more about it because I'm not really involved in that part of it. Okay. Um, and was there another question? Sorry. No, I think you've 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 covered off both in one hit. So um, obviously, there's a lot going on at the moment, right across the whole of music education and education generally. 
Um, the contributions have been really, really interesting. And I am going to ask everybody, every single panel member, if you did write your speech, can you please share it with the ISM so we can put it um, up on our website? Um, I'm going to finish with each of you, just 30 seconds. What do you think needs to happen? I will start with Phil. Well, as I said, we will have a new plan at some point uh, next year and we, we need to make the most of that. Um, but I think we don't stop advocating for all the kinds of change that we've talked about. Um, and that includes policy change uh, in this um, debate this morning. It's absolutely vital that we show the best examples and we carry on. ISM carries on fighting for and advocating for um, and particularly, um, we need to look at the workforce and how, what we do about that, because I think my my uh, Wi-Fi cut for a moment, but I want, wanted to go on to say we absolutely need to rebuild that and to work hard to do that regardless of anything else. So, yeah. OK, thank you. Over to you, Kevin. I think it's absolutely right. We keep on fighting on the big systemic issues that we might be facing. But I, let's be positive as well. Um, there is some fantastic music education going on out there, and that's down to individual teachers who really make sure they are providing the highest quality teaching and learning that they can provide. And if we do that, parents and young people will demand positive music education in the future. Great. Carl. Well, I mentioned earlier on that it's... It, it's um, it's arguable that we've already come off the back of a 10 year plan in education, but one that's not actually been shared and articulated uh, and is in the public domain and people can read and understand the journey that we're on. So mm. I would say that we need a, a, a vision and a plan for our education system that's inclusive and encompassing. That includes, you know, um, probably what Phil talks about in terms of the publication of uh, the, the, you know, the music plan for the country, but one that can be stuck to and not fiddled around with by politics every two, three, five years, because that's where you see impact over time. So a properly articulated plan that has gone through, that's inclusive, that takes the country through the next 10 years for our education system is what I would suggest. Brilliant. Kaliati. Yes, um, I've got so many issues. Um, one is, I mean, I totally agree about music teachers. I'm heartbroken because we've had amazing music teachers who've left because they are totally devastated and they're getting no support. Um, we had a wonderful head, head of um, music who left, went to a completely different profession. That's a big issue. Another is the issue of music and core subjects. I think this whole idea of the EBAC and the core subjects is a major issue. Um, my other is massive, I think, um, underlying thing to talk about is ideology. I do think that there is a move away from creative intelligence being important and that's a worry and if you talk about knowledge base, what knowledge are you talking about? Who is it aimed for? Um, how is it? What is the idea behind it? There's no such thing as an unpolitical knowledge. Um, it comes through history, through English, through everything. Um, so those things I'd, I'd say. So true, absolutely. What is knowledge? Discuss. Janetta, we won't ask you that question. <laughs> Thank <is> you. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, 30 seconds. Absolutely. Uh, and initially, encourage and facilitate teacher networks. Let's let teachers get together and talk about the great work we're doing and what help we need. Create time and space for music teachers to plan and deliver an effective curriculum. We need time, please. And Additionally, the final one for me as teachers, our responsibility, let's continue to diversify our curriculums and ensure that we are engaging all of our learners because there are a heck of a lot of children out there that want a really interesting music curriculum. Thank you so much, panel. You have been absolutely brilliant. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure being with you uh, this morning and I just want to give you a big round of applause. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you.